I'm going to talk about uh, this problem called maximum entry sampling and some algorithms uh, for it. The, uh, just at a high level, the viewpoint that I'm taking for the purpose of this talk is I want to exactly solve problems and so not get uh, approximation algorithms, not get asymptotic estimates, but exactly solve instances uh, that you could not trivially solve by, uh, by enumeration. So this is a combinatorial problem. And uh, it's quite hard already for uh, n, you'll see what n is, uh, n equal 200. And so uh, what I'm interested though is uh, in solving uh, these problems. So this is kind of the viewpoint of, uh, of uh, discrete optimization that lives in operations research type uh, departments of solving exactly moderate size instances. Uh, so uh, here we go. Um, Let's let's think uh, just to frame this mathematically. Uh, we have a finite set uh, one through n, and we have uh, random variables uh, n n random variables uh, with continuous uh, density function uh, g events. These are correlated random variables, and our our, our goal, the the problem that we want to look at is I'm given a, a number s uh, between one and n, and I want to choose a subset of size little s. So that when I observe not the whole vector of random variables, but this uh, subset indexed by S, uh, what I want to do is maximize the information obtained about the whole vector uh, just from looking at this uh, subvector. <clears throat> so the measure we'll use is uh, Shannon's uh, differential uh, entropy. So this is not a discrete entropy, um, but it's uh, entropy in the sense of it's uh, it's integrating, uh, you know, x log x over an appropriate uh, set uh, x. So um, to, uh, yeah, if you don't know about differential entropy, you can look in uh, Shannon's uh, paper where he defined the more well-known discrete entropy and you'll find differential entropy in there as well. Uh, this is Shannon here uh, wearing a mask because he's a good citizen at the University of Michigan. So he was an undergraduate here. He got two undergraduate degrees. I guess two is uh, a very significant thing and that's why he got a statue uh, made for him. Uh, but anyway, you should come uh, visit uh, Michigan on the engineering campus, not where Sasha sits. And you can uh, see this lovely statue of, uh, of Shannon. You can even take the mask off now. It's, uh, it's not mandatory anymore. Um, so anyway, uh, back to... Uh, to uh, differential entropy. So uh, in some calculations we'll do later, uh, it's, it's nice and simple exercise uh, in multivariable calculus to see that if you make some affine transformation of uh, this uh, differential entropy, that it just uh, adds to, uh, it gives an additive constant. Uh, and so what it means is that uh, ratios of entropies are not so significant. In fact, the entropy could be zero or negative. Uh, it's really arbitrary. It depends on, on the kind of the units that you're measuring in. And so what's uh, significant is uh, differences of entropies uh, that's invariant under uh, affine transformations. Uh, so the nice thing for us and what we're mainly going to concentrate on is uh, when Y has a joint Gaussian distribution. In this case, the entropy up to some constants is just the uh, logarithm of the determinant of the uh, principal submatrix of the covariance matrix. So remember we have a, a matrix C, a positive semi-definite matrix. We think of as the covariance matrix of this random uh, N vector. And uh, if we want the entropy of a subset uh, of N, uh, what we do is we look at the principal submatrix indexed by uh, S uh, here. And uh, we look at its log determinant uh, up to some constants. And the constants do depend on the, the size of the set. Uh, but up to some constants, uh, um, the entropy is just log debt uh, of this principal submatrix. So uh, this lets us frame, uh, you know, ex precisely what we call the maximum entropy sampling problem. So here we're given uh, matrix C, uh, this S, little s, that's how many elements we want to pick from our ground set uh, of n, n elements. And uh, well, the top part is what I already described. We want to find a maximum uh, entropy uh, subset. Uh, we fix the size of the set as a little less. And then we have side constraints. And side constraints are very useful in real applications. I'll talk about one application in a minute. Um, but you can imagine uh, that you're, um, 
you're going to observe a subset of these random variables and then maybe there's a cost associated with each observing a random variable and maybe there's a budget uh, uh, which could be uh, one of the B uh, coefficients and so you want to respect a budget constraint for example uh, or also can be other kind of logistics constraints like I should uh, pick at least one uh, random variable from this set or if I pick one from this set I should also pick one from that set so kind of equity uh, issues. Uh, anyway, this uh, problem, I didn't invent it. It comes from uh, the experimental design uh, literature and statistics. Uh, Hen Henry Wynn and uh, Mike Shuri uh, came up with this problem in 1987. Already other statisticians were looking at similar things. And you can find uh, quite a lot of literature on this in statistics, uh, and in particular experimental design or design of experiments uh, literature. Um, the, uh, you know, when this problem was uh, kind of uh, framed in, in the mid 80s, uh, people were, were thinking algorithmically, but uh, they weren't uh, versed in, uh, in mathematical optimization. So in their applications, they used heuristics of uh, all the things you would first think of. So greedy heuristics, uh, greedy kind of deletion heuristics, uh, local search heuristics of swapping pairs of elements in and out, all that kind of stuff. And that actually works, you know, rather well to get decent solutions or even exactly solve problems, say with n equal uh, 30. Um, but this runs out of gas at the scale that we're interested in, more like n a couple of hundred or even thousands. Uh, so I started getting involved in this really uh, 30 years ago. Um, and I've been you know involved in this off and on uh, since um, so uh, let me tell you a little bit uh, before we get into the the optimization view of it just if you're curious what the um, what the application looks like so as I mentioned there's this long uh, literature and statistics but in, in a kind of a subcult of statistics called environmental statistics or environmetrics and you can even buy uh, the Encyclopedia of Environmetrics if you're interested in hearing more about this, but you better have a very generous grant to do it. The Encyclopedia of Environmetrics costs, I think, $2,500. Uh, and I thought I would get a free copy by writing a small eight-page article in it, but no, apparently uh, if, if you have eight pages out of this six-volume set, uh, you get a electronic copy of your own article and, that, and that's it. Uh, but anyway, uh, th there's a, a lot of literature on this that I have not read because it's too expensive to read. Uh, but there's also tools. And one tool that uh, I've been involved in uh, is this last one uh, in, in the top paragraph called MESGEN Cove. Um, and this is a tool to take environmental monitoring data and turn it into a covariance matrix. And if you do the most naive thing possible, uh, you know, it's just some multivariate data uh, time series. And so if you do the most naive thing possible, you, you can cook up a sample covariance matrix, but it won't really uh, be uh, correct. It won't really model um, uh, correlated Gaussians. And so you have to do a lot of work to really take raw data and put it into a form where you believe the covariance matrix is really... Uh, modeling, um, you know, the covariance matrix for multivariate uh, Gaussians. But anyway, that's a, it's a long story, and we have a paper about it and some software. But, you know, generally what you have is you have, uh, instead of uh, just yj variables, you have yj at time point t uh, for discrete time points t, and uh, some real data that I'll talk about in a second, you have uh, weekly data. And uh, if you, if you just sort of treat it in a naive way, yeah, it won't be multivariate Gaussian. So you have to look for trends and get the trends out of it. And you have to take logarithms to kind of make the tails uh, look more like Gaussians. And it's really quite a lot of uh, work to prepare the data. Uh, but anyway, we've tried out a lot of our methods uh, on data that comes from this thing called the National Acidic uh, Deposition Program. Uh, they maintain uh, monitoring stations in presently about 255 locations in, in North America. So there's a lot of real data to experiment with if, you, uh, if that's your inclination and you want to play with this uh, problem. 
uh, I, I think it's kind of interesting uh, for this audience. So let me just talk about this a little bit. Uh, so what, what do you actually measure? Well, what's measured uh, at these stations is, well, water is collected, wet deposition, and uh, it's uh, analyzed for uh, pH and sulfates and nitrates and other things as well. Why sulfates and nitrates? Because those are markers for, um, for nitric acid and sulfuric acid. And nitric acid and sulfuric acid uh, in, in the air uh, and in rainwater in particular uh, lowers the pH significantly to below four. pH, you know, you learn in, uh, in, a, in a class neutral is seven, but rainwater, neutral rainwater is not seven. It's somewhat acidic. It's more like five and a half or so. And uh, once it gets below four, you have to remember a pH is, is a logarithmic scale. Four is very acid. Um, and so, you know, this has a terrible effect on all kinds of uh, life and on our infrastructure and bridges and things like this. So it's something to uh, be concerned about. Uh, this is <laughs> so how the rainwater is collected. It's in these like five gallon buckets that you can buy at Home Depot except, uh, well, the government procures them. And so they don't cost $10, they cost something like $10,000. And it's because they're not just, you know, you start with the bucket, but then there's uh, like a, a laptop mounted to it and there's a lid on the bucket. And when there's a little bit of rain, the lid opens up to catch the rainwater. And when there's no rain, the lid closes. Now, why not just keep the bucket open all the time? Well, it's because birds shit in the bucket. And, uh, you know, that's a whole other story to measure, you know, the effects of acid rain on birds. But we're not doing that. We're just interested in what's uh, coming into the rainwater. And so you get these uh, high, sort of high-tech, low-tech uh, collection uh, devices. Um, the, well, this I kind of, uh, I'm not going to get into the details of this. Uh, this is what you learn in uh, earth science class about how, uh, how, how, um, these, how sulfuric acid and nitric acid is, is kind of created from uh, uh, emission sources. So this network, um, you know, there's two ways you can kind of monitor uh, for, for these things. You could put a, um, a measuring device right on the top of a smokestack. And, uh, but there's something called the Clean Air Act in the U.S. This has been uh, improved and gutted and improved over many years. And uh, the Clean Air Act requires that you do monitoring, not just at the sources, but at potential um, uh, sites where, where uh, acid rain can develop. And so that's why there are these uh, dispersed uh, stations. Um, if we look just a little bit more, these dots give you an idea of where these stations are. They're kind of spread out all over the place. And uh, the question, you know, from the point of view of this uh, maximum entropy sampling problem that I mentioned at the beginning is maybe you don't really need to operate 250 of these stations. You have all this data dating back to 1978. So you have a lot of data on these uh, uh, random variables, uh, realizations. And so the point is maybe you can operate 50 or 100 of these stations and get just as much uh, information, uh, possibly... Uh, you don't want to operate two stations really near each other. Maybe you do if the weather patterns is such that they're really observing very different things. Um, so uh, that's the kind of idea. This was, um, what was this? Uh, essentially pH uh, back in 1987. Uh, if you look in 2018, uh, it's much better. Um, you should check. I haven't changed what the scale means. No, it's the same thing. Uh, so this is nice, right? Some things do get better. Um, you know, sometimes we think that doesn't happen, but, uh, things do get better sometimes. And I think this is an example of where things got better because, you know, people are watching. Uh, but anyway, uh, let's move on. I think you have a good idea of what a potential application is. Ah, this, I just want to show you quickly that if you look at like sulfate concentrations, this is a particular monitoring station, you see cyclical trends too. Uh, the, the period is a year and that's just because, uh, you know, of changes in, uh, in uh, not climate, but in, uh, uh, in uh, you know, the, the weather over a yearly basis. And so these are things, if you just take uh, 
real data you have to deal with. You have to become a statistician or have good friends that are statisticians if you want to get reasonable covariance matrices to, uh, to do optimization on and, and believe that you're uh, really solving problems that have something to do with the real world. Uh, anyway, let's get out of all that and get back to, uh, or get to the uh, algorithmics. So even without the side constraints, those AX less than or equal to B constraints, um, th this is a hard problem. So, uh, so it's an, a, it's an NP uh, complete, uh, or it's NP hard problem. So um, if I give you a graph and you want to find out, uh, is there a stable set of size uh, S? So S vertices with no edges between them. Uh, it, it's a pretty simple exercise in matrix algebra, some sort of combinatorial matrix algebra, to see that if you take the adjacency matrix of the graph and you put ends on the diagonal, uh, that in fact, the uh, largest determinant um, uh, principal submatrices of size S will be the um, stable sets. So they'll just have ends on the diagonal and zeros off diagonal. And uh, it's not a hard uh, matrix algebra um, exercise to check that. Uh, so maximizing the determinant will answer the question, is there a stable set of, of the right size? Uh, on the easy side, uh, if the uh, matrix C, or if it's inverse, we'll see, is uh, tridiagonal, so just uh, diagonal entries, and then the two adjacent bands are, uh, are the only other non-zeros, you can solve the uh, maximum entropy sampling problem uh, if, if there's no side constraints by dynamic programming. Or I suppose uh, if uh, the side constraints had a knapsack structure, you could also solve it by dynamic programming um, in like, I don't know, into the fifth time if you do it crudely. Um, the other nice thing, and it's more useful for developing approximation algorithms, uh, which is a whole other uh, approach to the problem, is that the uh, log debt of uh, C of a principal submatrix, uh, you know, indexed by S, is a submodular uh, function, um, which in matrix algebra is known as the Hadamard Fisher inequalities. And uh, maximizing a submodular function is an NP-hard problem, but in some sense, it's a relatively easy uh, NP-hard problem. And so there's a big literature on approximation algorithms for uh, maximizing submodular functions. Monotone ones are even better, but non-monotone submodular functions like, the, like our problem, uh, you can directly apply those algorithms and get constant factor approximation schemes. But we're not taking that approach. Uh, we're more interested in getting concrete uh, solutions, uh, exact solutions for modest size n, like n equal 200. So uh, three little tools that we can use over and over again are the following. First is that the uh, if I scale a matrix C by a, constant, a positive constant gamma, then the optimal value of the maximum entropy sampling problem just shifts by uh, S log gamma. That's a trivial thing to check. And what it means is that uh, if I have an upper bounding method for Z, the uh, optimal value, uh, it might be better to apply that upper bounding method to a scaled problem. So it's possible for a given gamma that an upper bounding method, even, even though there's a the simple shift of, uh, of the optimal value by S log gamma, the upper bound might not shift by S log gamma. And then it's, uh, it behooves you to find the best possible gamma to uh, minimize uh, an upper bound on, the, uh, on, on this quantity, this uh, Z of uh, blah, blah, blah. So uh, that's a useful thing. Uh, another slightly less trivial thing is that there's a kind of a complementary problem based on also such a matrix equation. And so if I wanna solve the uh, entry problem that I posed, I can as well uh, take the inverse of the covariance matrix then instead of picking uh, S points, I pick N minus S points. I have to play with the constraints as well. But what that does is it shifts the optimal value by, uh, by the entropy of the entire set, uh, log that C. And that's what we call the complementary problem. And the same comment applies there as applies to uh, the scaling idea that maybe I have an upper bounding method that's not invariant under this complementation. And so it might behoove me to look at the upper bound uh, on the right-hand side for this complementary problem, add log that C to it, 
And that gives me an upper bound on the original problem. And that may be better than applying the same upper bounding method to the original problem. And lastly, in this vein, if I take uh, any correlation matrix, so a covariance matrix of ones on the diagonal, and I take its uh, element-wise product with the matrix C, um, what I, what I effectively do is I add entropy to the problem, to all subsets. Um, so uh, yeah, I add disorder to the problem. And um, you think about like, suppose M was the identity matrix, so the most simple correlation matrix. Then what I'm doing is I'm forgetting all the uh, covariances and I'm just pretending everything is uh, independent. And uh, this generally works that, um, if I uh, what I call mask a covariance matrix with a correlation matrix, uh, the entropy can only go up. Surprisingly, if I have an upper bounding method for the original entropy, even though the entropy may go up, the upper bound on uh, on that sort of relaxed problem may give me a stronger bound uh, than applying that bounding method to the original problem. Um, and that's, uh, that's uh, this third kind of generic useful technique to apply with, in conjunction with bounding methods. And this kind of inequality is, comes from something called Oppenheim's inequality in, uh, in matrix algebra. Uh, I mean, you can find all of these tools in, uh, you know, some book like, uh, like this or whatever your favorite matrix book is. Um, so uh, yeah, what are the algorithmic approaches? Uh, so as I said, there's simple heuristics. Those heuristics become not so easy to apply if you have side constraints, these AX less than or equal to B constraints. Uh, it's not so easy to kind of do local search and move around if you have complicated uh, side constraints. But anyway, that's a good way to get uh, lower bounds on the optimal value by using heuristics. Uh, and then as I mentioned, there's a big literature on approximation algorithms uh, for um, for maximizing submodular functions in general, uh, but also some specialized for, uh, for the, the particular submodular functions that come from entropy. Um, and then there's uh, exact algorithms, and that's really what I'm going to talk about. The exact algorithms are based on something called a branch and bound framework. Uh, if you, uh, you know, hang out with people like I hang out with, uh, they know what branch and bound is, but I don't expect everybody in this audience knows what branch and bound is. So I'll, I'll tell you what it is. It's, it's almost an embarrassingly, uh, it's almost an embarrassing uh, kind of algorithmic framework to apply to discrete optimization problems, but it actually works. So uh, uh, if you apply it with some care, so I'll, I'll bore you with some details about how that works for this particular problem. Um, and the other thing is, since we're doing branch and bound, and I mentioned upper bounds quite a bit, uh, I think many of you know that the, the Gaussian uh, maximizes the entropy among all um, uh, random vectors with the same covariance matrix. And so what it means is if I have a bounding method for the Gaussian, that same bounding method applies for any distribution. And so all these bounding methods that I'm going to talk about would just as well work for uh, non-Gaussians in, in terms of getting upper bounds. But what you can expect is that for non-Gaussians, the uh, bounds will be worse since they're valid for Gaussians. And so you would expect branch and bound to do worse for non-Gaussian distributions. Uh, so uh, that's all I'll say about that, but that's an interesting uh, uh, point. Uh, okay, so what is branch and bound? Again, it's almost embarrassing, uh, but uh, let me just sort of say what it is. So what we do is we maintain a list of subproblems. What a subproblem has is some elements fixed out of the solution. Uh, remember, we're trying to pick a set S of size little s, and I fix some uh, points from one through n out of the solution. I call it F0. And I fix other points into the solution, I call that F1. So that's what a, a subproblem is. It's the original problem with um, uh, some of the uh, points fixed out and some points fixed in. If you look here, this is you know, written in terms of variables, where I think of uh, you know, an element that's fixed into the solution as a variable set to one, and an uh, element that's fixed out set to zero. And this is uh, the... Um, 
uh, this is a continuous relaxation, what I've written here of the uh, of the sub problem uh, with the, that it's determined by F zero and F one. So anyway, you have these sub problems. Uh, what happens uh, to the objective function for a sub problem is you have to look at the conditional covariance matrix where you're forced to observe the uh, variables indexed by F1. So since you're forced to observe them, you pick, the, uh, pick up the entropy of uh, those random variables. And then uh, you have to look at the uh, short complement or conditional covariance matrix. And that's what's kind of indicated here. You've already picked F1, size of F1 variables from S. So now your remaining subproblem, you pick uh, fewer S minus the size of F1. So anyway, you, you keep this list. At the beginning, uh, the list is just the original problem. And then the other object you need is a lower bound on the optimal solution, which you can get from a heuristic or it could be minus infinity at the beginning. And uh, those are the two things that branch and bound juggles. It juggles this list and it juggles the lower bound. What it tries to do, there's only one problem on the list, the original problem and branch and bounds only goal is to empty the list. And it's so close, you only have one problem on the list and you need an empty list and you have this lower bound. Ultimately you want the lower bound to be the optimal value. And uh, well, what the algorithm does is it processes the list. It takes problems off the list and uh, it looks at two so-called children of that problem, and it might put the children on the list or it might throw the children away. At the very beginning, if you can throw both of your children away, you're, you're a free person again, and uh, you've solved the problem. Um, typically, that's not what happens. The list gets bigger. Your children survive for a while, and, uh, and you've got to get the, the, maybe you get rid of your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren. So uh, what you do uh, technically is um, you have to maintain an invariant property of the algorithm. And it's that every problem, uh, every subproblem on the list it should be feasible, uh, meaning there should be feasible solutions, but the continuous relaxation of the corresponding subproblem does not have a unique feasible solution. Um, so that's uh, uh, one property that we keep for the list. And the other is that uh, if there's a feasible solution that's better than your current lower bound, it should be feasible for some problem on the list. So that the lists give you all possible improvements that, could, that there could be on the lower bound. And that's all you need to do. And then you just stop when the list is empty. And so, well, you have to think about how to process the... Uh, uh, problems on the list. So you pop a problem off the list, you apply some upper bounding method. And that's really the heart of uh, the talk is these upper bounding methods that I'll come to soon. Um, but you calculate this upper bounding method and you see if the upper bound for that sub problem is smaller than the lower bound on the whole problem. If it is, then no feasible solution to that sub problem could improve on the, uh, on the overall lower bound. And if you think about the invariant property of the list, you can just throw that away. Um, so that's what you hope. You hope to discard subproblems that way. If not, you have to do what's called branching, which is create two children. So you take a, some index that's alive that hasn't been fixed uh, in or out of the solution, and you create uh, an in child where you force that into the solution, and you create an out child where you uh, force it out of the solution. Uh, it's easy to see that any feasible solution for the parent is feasible to one of the two children because he, that index J is either in or out of the uh, uh, solution. So, uh, well, this is how we treat our children. And you have to remember, I mean, no child is a bad child, but still, you know, we want our freedom back. And so we want to discard children because it's the only way we get to go home is we empty our list of all of our descendants. Um, so what you do is you, uh, you see if fixing this solution uh, to um, uh, this J into the solution, adding it to F1, if that gives you S uh, indices, then F1 plus J is the unique set satisfying, uh, uh, that, that's feasible for the parent and has uh, um, exactly S elements, so you discard the, the poor child. Uh, and if, uh, because now you have a unique solution to the subproblem. And so if you think about the first part of the um, uh, invariant properties, we, we get to throw that problem out, but we should check whether that was a good solution that we're throwing out. And so we check if it's feasible and we see if it can update the lower bound. We do similarly for the other child, 
I won't uh, bore you with those details. The only other little wrinkle is um, if you can't discard a child based on one of those rules and you think about those invariant properties, what we should check is that the feasible region of the continuous relaxation uh, has a unique solution. And that you can do by solving a linear programming problem. It's a little bit tricky how to set it up, but uh, you, can, you can do that. Um, so uh, that's the only other little wrinkle. And if uh, it has a unique solution, it happens to be binary, you update the lower bound. Uh, so let me get into uh, the heart of this. I have 15 minutes, so I'm not going to uh, uh, dawdle too much. So th th we need upper bounding methods. And the simplest upper bounding method is you just, uh, if you're thinking about an upper bound on a determinant of a principal submatrix, just take the product of the eigenvalues, the S largest eigenvalues of the entire matrix. And that will give you an upper bound on that determinant just by eigenvalue interlacing inequalities. And if you apply that masking idea and use a mask of the identity matrix, that just means taking the um, element wise product with the mask and the covariance matrix, then you can already see that Again, the product, one way to see that the product of the diagonal elements, the S biggest diagonal elements of C is also an upper bound on the determinant of a principal submatrix. So those upper bounding methods are quite good. Those will already allow you in this branch and bound framework to solve problems that you couldn't solve by enumeration. Uh, there, I won't get into this. There's a lot more about the so-called spectral bounding methods. Uh, so you can do a lot more of this. You can handle side constraints uh, using Lagrangian relaxation. Uh, you can um, uh, do much more with masking. I, I said you could take the identity mask, but you could actually try to optimize over the mask. Uh, that's a non-convex uh, minimization problem to find the optimal mask to find the best spectral upper bound, but you, you can try to work on that. And uh, well, blah, 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 that's a long uh, uh, topic. And there's some references if you're curious. Uh, uh, a way to really uh, make some progress on this uh, in, a, in a, a strong way is to look at convex programming relaxations. So we, it's a discrete problem. The objective uh, looks like a kind of a concave function. You have log determinant. And, but we haven't really defined uh, what, the, uh, what the relaxation is uh, for, uh, for continuous values of x. But um, thinking that way uh, is a very useful thing because there's a, a, a lot of tools in uh, an area called convex mixed integer nonlinear programming. So what that means is if I have variables, some of which are integer and some are continuous, and otherwise I have convex constraints and say concave maximization, uh, then when the relaxation is a convex program and uh, there's nice tools like what's called variable fixing. Uh, all it means is that if you look at the Lagrangian dual of this convex program and you look at the optimal dual variables, if an optimal dual variable is very big uh, on a uh, constraint that says X should be between zero and one, then the associated constraint um, should be satisfied as an equation. And it allows you uh, to look at dual variables and fix variables at zero or one. And this can greatly reduce the size of, uh, of a problem you're trying to uh, solve. So this kind of general trick can be applied to several of the methods that I'm going to squeeze in in the next 10 minutes. Um, so uh, yeah, there's, there's lots of different bounding methods, uh, kind of just quick linear algebra or uh, matrix algebra thing to notice is that if I give you a zero one vector, that's the characteristic vector of S. So little s ones, uh, N minus S um, zeros. And I look at uh, what I have here on the left, diag of X, C, diag of X, plus diag of the vector of one of the complement of X. Uh, if you work that out, what you'll see is this. And so what it means is now the log debt of this is what you want. It's the log debt of uh, CSS. And this part is important here because if I didn't have this part, I would have zero here. And then the log debt of this would be uh, minus infinity and that wouldn't be so good. Um, so it's really important to do this kind of uh, add the complement thing so that the log debt of this is the, uh, is the entropy. Uh, so this leads to this kind of formulation, but the problem is this formulation 
is not uh, the objective that you're maximizing is not a concave function. Uh, but it's a starting point for thinking about, well, how can I modify this to get a concave function uh, and, and uh, make this a, a tractable uh, op global optimization problem? Uh, so what we did some time ago, a couple of decades ago, uh, is to, um, it's a big part of the PhD thesis of Marcia Fampo, who's on the call, um, is to um, uh, take these uh, variables and raise them to power. So x to the p over 2 means uh, xi to the pi over 2. And uh, same thing here, uh, this is, you know, di to the xi. So you create these uh, numbers, uh, positive numbers di and these powers pi. And by choosing these parameters the right way, you can make this a, um, a concave function. So that's kind of one approach. And then you can think about not just choosing them to make this concave, but choosing them to make it concave and make the upper bound as small as possible. And uh, so that's uh, one kind of, old, that was the first convex programming uh, upper bound for, uh, for this problem. Um, the uh, more recent, you know, coming into uh, this, uh, this millennium, uh, there's what's called the links bound. So links means linear in X. And this is a bound that Kurt Anstrecker came up with. And uh, it sort of looks the same, but what's different is before we had diag x on the outside of C, and now the diag x is in between two Cs. And because there's two Cs, that's sort of where this half is coming from. And uh, well, the nice thing about this bound is uh, it's, um, you can apply general purpose uh, nonlinear programming software, even convex optimization software, because uh, a lot of convex optimization software can recognize that this objective function is a concave uh, objective function. That's important for uh, sort of conic solvers. Um, it has this self-complementary property, which is kind of nice. If I look at the complementary problem, the bound is the same, uh, which is true for that spectral bound, but it wasn't true for that uh, previous nonlinear programming bound. Uh, it's also very sensitive to a scaling parameter, but we were able to show that um, choosing a scaling factor uh, for this uh, C matrix um, is, can be framed as a, as a com convex minimization problem. So finding the best upper bound overall scalings of the C matrix is a tractable problem. If you just want to, I won't get into the details, if you want to see why this is a really a relaxation. I think it was easier to see for this uh, this kind of uh, relaxation uh, where the X is on the outside. If it's on the inside, it's also kind of a matrix algebra exercise that, that I won't bore you with now um, uh, to see that this really is a uh, upper bound. Uh, so um, yeah, this uh, masking idea for the links bound can be very effective. So we were able to show that even under optimal scaling, uh, these scale factors, uh, gamma and gamma bar, um, you can benefit from masking the problem. So it, this is unmasked. So J is the mask of all ones. So that, that means I don't mask at all. I is the, this kind of very aggressive mask where I throw out all the dependence between the random variables. And what we can show is that the difference in these um, uh, uh, this links bound uh, can grow uh, linearly in uh, n, uh, and that's that's a linearly in n is a big difference in uh, in entropies. Um, so yeah, the message is that masking can help a lot. Um, the Mohit, how much time do I have? Uh, give me an upper bound. Five minutes. Five minutes. Uh, so yeah, there's another thing called the factorization bound. And again, I won't get into the details of why it's a bound, but I think you can work it out. Uh, so you can see what it is. Uh, it's based on looking at the product of the uh, S largest eigenvalues of this matrix. Uh, in a way, it's like the links bound. The X is on the inside, but I don't put C on the outside. I factor C into say, you know, I do like a Cholesky factorization or a spectral decomposition. And uh, this bound, uh, it, it kind of combines the idea of the uh, eigenvalue bound and the links bound in a certain way. 
And it's not a convex program. So it looks like a non-starter. But what you can do is take the Lagrangian dual of this. And the Lagrangian dual uh, is always a convex program. Uh, but this is kind of a nasty problem to try to solve. We, we've tried this with software. It, it doesn't work so well. First, it's a big problem. You've got this uh, matrix uh, variable here. You've got some other variables of size uh, n uh, here and here. That corresponds to how many side constraints there are. But this is a real problem. You have this positive definite matrix variable here. And this is actually kind of a hard problem to solve exactly if you solve it directly. But the trick uh, that uh, Nikolov used is to take the Lagrangian dual again. And you don't get back to the original problem. It can't because the original problem wasn't convex. And the Lagrangian dual is always convex. So if you take the dual again, you get a problem we call DD fact. And it has almost a nice, almost a very simple form. The constraints come out simple again after some work. There's only n variables. The objective, the complexity of it is all hidden in this gamma function. And I'll flash what it is in a second, but um, this ends up being really kind of a nice problem. Uh, it's uh, the gamma function is based on uh, eigenvalues of, uh, of this matrix uh, again, but um, it's uh, this bound is independent of the factorization of the C matrix. It's invariant under scaling. Uh, you can prove that it dominates the spectral bound because the spectral bound actually gives you a feasible solution of de fact, the problem, that intermediate problem with the theta in it. And, but this complementation technique is, is still uh, useful. Um, the gamma function, I'll, I'll skip it, uh, but I'll, you know, I'll make these slides available. You can see what it is. Um, and uh, yeah, so quickly, uh, there's another bound called the BQP bound. BQP is for Boolean quadric polytope. What you do is you take the uh, vector little x and you lift it to matrix space. So you think of big X as a relaxation of little x, little x transpose, the outer product of x with itself. And for, um, you know, zero, one variables x, it's you know capturing when a pair of variables are both equal to one or or uh, they're not both equal to one. Um, so uh, you can uh, you know look at the Shor relaxation of this uh, x equals x x transpose, make this a convex uh, set of constraints. You can tighten things up a little by adding uh, these kind of linear constraints, and this is what uh, Ann Stryker called the uh, the BQP bound. Um, curiously, a uh, guy, Christoph Helmberg, told us this idea in 1995, told Kurt and me, and well, we were busy at that moment in time, but it actually is a very good bound, and uh, Christoph told us to look at this, and, you know, it took uh, over 20 years for one of us to uh, decide uh, to look at it, but that's actually a pretty good bound. It, it's failing is that it's got a lot of variables because of the matrix variable, and so it actually, I think, is not competitive with the links and and uh, the uh, factorization bound. Uh, there's an idea of mixing bounds. So you can take any bounds that I've already talked about and mix them. And what that means is taking a weighted combination of them. So, you know, just at a high level, I, I look at taking a weighted combination of many different bounding methods uh, with the same variables. And uh, you can do better than taking the individual bounds because you get of uh, this function, you get uh, convexity in this weighting vector. And so if you find the best weighting, it may beat the individual bounds uh, by themselves. This works well when the individual bounds are close to each other. And so we've applied this uh, effectively. Um, yeah, so I'll try to wind it up. So, you know, we have some papers about this uh, um, uh, mixing bounds. Uh, so, you know, I started with the application and I talked about all these bounding methods, where are the computational results, well, they're not here, uh, but they're in the papers that are references at the end of this, uh, of this deck. Um, I, I don't like to look at people's computational results in real time because they never explain what the axes are. I would do that too. I wouldn't explain what the axes are. I wouldn't know what they're talking about. So I let you brood on that when you look at the papers. If you want to read more about this, there's all the references, but there's a book that we're publishing this year. Uh, and uh, then you can see it all in one place and not have to uh, wrestle with the fact that every paper uses a different notation. 
so yeah, the remaining uh, slides here, 30 to 36 are just the references if you wanna look in this deck. Uh, well, not all of them is this one. Anyway, that's it.